Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to night two of the Learning Revolution Conference Online. So fun to have Mark Treadwell here. I'm not going to ask him to respond at this moment because he is uh, at the beach in New Zealand on a fairly tenuous internet connection. And so we're going to reduce the back and forth with him as much as possible. <clears throat> but uh, we're so glad to have Mark here. Thanks to Classflow, classflow.com, for their support for the Marine Revolution Conference. And thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for this terrific way of holding online events. Those of you who are participating live in the chat, you can let us know where you're participating from. Look to the left and click on the star icon. Probably need to double click it, then you can click on the map. And put in the chat where you're participating from as well. That's often a fun way for us to see. So aside from Mark in New Zealand, it looks like we may be a North America-centric audience. And while I move forward here, I'm going to let you keep putting those notes in the chat, but turn the time over to you, Mark. And Mark, we will communicate with you by chat. Thanks so much for being here. That's great. Uh, welcome to everybody. And uh, it is uh, just uh, after midday. It's 1 o'clock in the afternoon here in New Zealand on a beautiful day. And uh, what I want to do in the next uh, 40 to 45 minutes is really just give you a bit of an overview of some of the research we have been looking at in terms of how the brain learns. One of the extraordinary things about this, of course, is that uh, the characters in this play uh, historically have been the neurons. So neurons have been the thing that we have talked about in terms of what makes a difference in the brain. But in terms of what we now understand is that, in fact, when we are born, uh, most of our brain is actually made up of neurons, about 90%. Uh, and the other 10% is a class of cells called glial cells. And what we're now starting to realize uh, over the last five years is that that percentage changes dramatically between when we're born and by the time we're in our mid to late 20s. So by the time we're in our mid to late 20s, the percentage of neurons has dropped from 90% to about 7%. And the percentage of glial cells has gone from 10% maximum up to around 93%. The dominant cell uh, in that mix of glial cells is a cell type called astrocytes. And astrocytes work with the neurons. And as you get more clever as you age, as you get more ideas and concepts and concept frameworks, the brain downloads additional cells from a little structure inside the center of the brain called the gyrus. In the gyrus, uh, there are some stem cells, and those stem cells are downloaded. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, I did that, by the way, too, Peggy. Um, so as we age, we're getting more clever, but we download more astrocytes from, uh, from the, the stem cells, and they become astrocytes in our brain. So as we age, as we get more clever, we essentially become uh, more dominated in our brain by astrocytes. And so the more clever you are, the more of these astrocyte cells that we actually have in our brains. So that changes as we go on in life. And what happens then is something quite extraordinary. And to give you a demonstration of the shift in, in our thinking around this, there was a wonderful experiment done in 2012 and reported in uh, a number of journals, in particular Science and uh, Nature and Neuron. And what they did was uh, they had some mice embryos and they added some of those stem cells I was talking about from the gyrus to the actual cells 
and yes, don't worry too much about that title there. Um, but what they did in this um, in this experiment is they added some human astrocytic cells to the mice embryo, and then reimpregnated the mice with these adjusted uh, embryos. And when the mice were born, the structure of their brains was quite different, dramatically so. And then they got uh, ethics committee approval to allow the mice to live for a while and actually see whether or not they were smarter. And when they tested these mice for how additionally smarter they might be, it turned out that the mice were 300% more clever just by actually having these extra cells called astrocytes in their brains. So what we're now learning is that these astrocytes are heavily involved in the learning process and they are the dominant cell in our learning process. So what we want to now be able to do is start looking at this process overall and its impact. So about four years ago we completed a literature review of the state of play around this and uh, we made some predictions around how this might play out. And one of the ways that this might play out is that rather than having a single learning system, human beings more than likely have four learning systems. And human beings are the only species with all four learning systems. Most other species only have the first one and partly the second one. So I'll go through those uh, briefly as to what those systems are. So the four learning systems are the first one being the fact that we process our sensory data and human beings have 23 senses. So not only do we have our touch, taste, feel, see senses, our five notable senses, uh, but we also have a senses such as a sense of balance and we also have a range of homeostatic senses uh, that also allow us to know what our body is doing as well as our external world is doing. So our brain's first learning system is our ability to sense our world and what that means for us as human beings. So we sense our world outside of ourselves, but also the brain senses uh, what's happening inside our body. So it's our first one, and our sensory data, generally speaking, is uh, great in terms of giving us data into our bodies, into our brain, so it can be processed, but it's not very good at actually interpreting that absolutely correctly. So one of the uh, things I often get people to do is I put up a, a picture and I ask them to visualise the picture in their minds Then I take the picture away and I say, right, now I want you to recall the picture in your head and imagine that picture in your head. And what people start to realise is that they can't actually see pictures in their heads. It's actually not possible. It's a, a strong belief amongst many, many people that we can see images in our mind, but it's actually not possible. Because if we could do that, then of course we'd all have a photographic memory and we'd have a perfect memory. Uh, but that's not the case. Our memory is imperfect at the very least. Uh, and so our sensory data is fairly good. Uh, we're up there with some of the top creatures in the world, uh, species. Um, <laughs> people are disagreeing already that they can see pictures in their head. Um, unfortunately, you can't. Um, it's, it's a nice idea. And it took me a couple of months to actually um, to actually work that out and to uh, come to terms with that, I suppose. So our sensory data is not brilliant. And witness recall, as someone is saying now, uh, is, is one of the big things. When people witness an event, their interpretations of the event are vastly different. And so police have got very good at actually trying to work out what probably happened given the information that they're given. Uh, our, second, 
Our second learning system is our ability to learn sequences. So sequences are what we might call by, off, by rote learning or off by heart. And uh, our rote learning processes, uh, that process is mostly managed by neurons in the brain in terms of interpretation. Um, and our rote learning, though, gives us a distribution curve of ability based almost entirely on who your parents were. So if you chose your parents well, you'll be fairly good at learning via rote. If you chose your parents poorly, you may not quite have the same capacity as others. And this has massive implications for reading and writing in particular. With reading and writing, there's a huge amount of rote learning. You've got to remember the 26 letters, their shape, size, okay? You've got to be able to know their sounds. Then you've got to actually remember words made up of those shapes and sounds. Uh, for example, if you have to uh, remember the word rat, uh, you can't look at the word rat and go, you know, I look at the word, I think that a rat would be, and they have whiskers, it may be reasonably small, they have a long tail, it might be a bit scary. And uh, the, the rat, actually, you have to learn that word off by heart. You have to repeat it and repeat it and get used to seeing it to actually realise this is the word rat. You can get some understanding of the sound that word makes, but the connection to the actual animal is something we have to learn via rote. Our third learning system is equitable for everybody. And if we go back to learning by rote, one of the reasons that learning by rote is not particularly good is because if you go back two, three hundred years, how much learning off by heart did we do back then? And the answer is not very much at all. Really, learning by rote only became common for most people with the advent of compulsory schooling. And with compulsory schooling, we saw the first shift from learning by rote, uh, learning orally, from most of our the learning was oral learning uh, 200 years ago plus. And that, over the last 200 years, has slowly shifted that paradigm of rote learning uh, has shifted from being uh, oral to being text-based. And so text has changed the centricity of our learning paradigm from oral to text-based. Uh, and that's been with us now for some time. And so that's really given us this notion that some children are more intelligent than others because some could learn to read better than others uh, and write. Now, that reading and writing was fundamentally based on learning off by heart, learning by rote, learning sequences and remembering those. And we have quite a variation in that. And so we have the traditional groupings. Uh, most of you out there probably were in the top reading group and uh, or the middle reading group. Very few of you probably listened to this were actually in the bottom group. But the bottom group were soon learning that they were not as smart as the people in the red group, which is inevitably the top group of readers and writers. But when it comes to generating ideas and concepts, the third learning system, and that's managed by the astrocytes in conjunction with the neurons. So neurons communicate electrically and astrocytes communicate chemically. So they've got two different systems there, but they can talk to each other, and they both have neurotransmitters, and they both contribute to the generation of uh, ideas and concepts. And so when we're driving a car, for example, or learning to drive a car, what happens is that boys in particular, because they believe that driving a car will make them an overnight sensation with the ladies, um, they're excited about it. And astrocytes actually work out which patterns, ideas and concepts, which patterns we should map and which ones we don't need to map as quickly or not bother with at all. So if you're excited about something, generally speaking, you'll map that idea or concept quite quickly. 
So boys being excited about driving actually map and learn to drive slightly quicker than girls who are not as excited about learning to drive. That difference is marginal, but it makes a difference overall, and it's global. Boys tend to learn to drive more quickly, not faster as in speed, but uh, faster in terms of learning the process of driving uh, a bit more quickly than, than girls, because those astrocytes pick up the fact that this is important, it's exciting, and it should be learned. And you can go back uh, two or three hundred years ago and ask ourselves, how many concepts and how many ideas did we have to learn two or three hundred years ago? And it turns out that we had to learn lots and lots of them. There were lots of ideas and concepts that we had to learn two hundred years ago. Uh, we had to learn body language in particular, status of the people we were working with, who could I interact with. We had to have a sense of time, space, place, crops, seasons. Uh, we were learning concepts since we've been on the planet. And so our ability to learn concepts is fairly equitable and also really, really efficient. To give you a scale of the difference between how well we learn by a rote and how well we learn ideas and concepts, consider two learning processes. One is learning to read and write, which is mostly done by a rote. Okay? We, we learn by rote to learn to read and write when we learn those words and letters and the shapes and sounds and all that sort of thing. Uh, but that process of learn to read and write takes five to seven thousand hours. Okay, it's not very efficient. So we're talking now about the rote learning as our second learning system. But when we talk about driving, driving mostly uses our third learning system, and our third learning system is about generating ideas and concepts. When you sit in a car, almost. Minimal information is given to you. Essentially, the driving instructor or your parent or someone, like a family friend, says, that one there in the middle is the brake. That one next to it is the accelerator. Don't get that wrong. There's no history of the car. There's no, we'll talk about Mr. Ford and what he did in terms of production lines and et cetera, et cetera. There's no understanding necessary of the ignition system, what a coil does, what a carburetor does, et cetera. So when we learn to drive, it's a very, very efficient system, and it's very, very equitable. Clever people, rocket scientists, etc., don't learn to drive any more quickly than the average person. Okay? So what we're looking at here is a very, very efficient learning system, learning concepts, because when you learn to drive, the first concept you work with is steering. And then after a few minutes, you fully get steering. You can actually learn to steer the car very quickly. Then the next thing you learn to do is braking. The braking uh, process is actually calculus, because what you've got to do when you're braking to stop at that white line just before the uh, traffic light is you've got to slow down steadily to come to a stop. In other words, you've got to actually look at the rate of change of your speed for the distance you have to slow down over. Okay, So the process of braking is very, very complex, but after about five minutes of practicing slowing down at different speeds, the astrocytes map that pattern and automate it. The astrocytes essentially say to the neurons, look, stop thinking about this. Stop thinking about this and let us take over this process for you. So what the astrocytes allow us to do is it allows a conscious process, which steering is when you first try it and braking is when you first try it. But then once you automated that process, you don't have to think about it anymore. Okay. So what happens is that over time, you automate most of your life. And this automaticity 
is the responsibility in the process carried out by these astrocytes in mapping patterns that represent ideas and concepts. So the process uh, for learning needs to actually work with things we're good at and actually reduce the things we're not so good at. So generating ideas and concepts we're fantastic at. Learning via rote, we've got that distribution curve. That distribution curve is condensed significantly if we work on ideas and concepts. Our fourth learning system is creativity. And creativity happens through uh, a number of possible processes, and this is an area that still isn't clear yet in terms of the research. Uh, but we're pretty sure now that it's managed by brain waves. Brain waves largely are produced by neurons. Astrocytes have chemical processes, but they can't generate brain waves. So what the astrocytes do is they trigger the neurons to generate brain waves to try and link knowledge that we've created, sensory data that we've stored, ideas that we've come up with, concepts we've come up with, and concept frameworks we might have come up with. So creativity is about mixing all those things up together to come up with new knowledge, ideas, concepts, and concept frameworks. So creativity, our fourth learning system, once again, is the same for everybody. And so everybody has about the same level of creativity. There's not much difference. So for three of our learning processes, we're all about equitable. We're about the same capacity. One of those, learning by rote, is very much around how what we inherited from our parents. So what we need to be aware of in teaching and learning is how do we actually then overcome that? How do we limit the learning via rote? And can we limit that to make learning more fair and equitable? One way we can do that is by rethinking. Let's get the right slide here. Oh, my slides are gone. Oh, no, I've lost one of my slides for some reason. Um, one of the uh, processes we've been working around is that uh, if we could actually get a prompt, so if, if we're not seeing the slide, yeah, I'm not seeing the slide either, it's disappeared for some reason. I'm um, not quite sure why. Well, the competencies are there, some of them are there, some aren't. Oh, okay, that one's there, that's good. Let's go back to this one here. Uh, that's not there, okay. Right here. Um, the processes that underpin this um, in terms of learning means that if we could actually minimise uh, the rote aspect and then introducing uh, the, the, the knowledge just in time rather than just in case, we have a better chance of all students learning at about the same rate. If we look at uh, how we learn in the natural sense, uh, I had a young boy, uh, the other day I was down at the cafe down at the beach here, and uh, a little two-year-old was playing around and he spotted a bumblebee, and he was totally fascinated, totally fascinated by the bumblebee crawling across the, the car park there. And he was fascinated by the stripes, the wings, the fact that he was walking. Why wasn't he flying? Uh, these were things he was really curious about. So what had happened was this prompt, the bumblebee, stimulated this young boy to actually become curious. But what had stimulated the curiosity was he was excited. Okay? And uh, if you... Um, I'm just trying to do this thing at the same time. Um, if we can actually work with a natural way of learning, which is actually curiosity, spurning this thing to actually want to ask questions from curiosity, so we have a prompt that happens, uh, we then feel an emotion because of prompt, so you look to the bee and that's really exciting, what does it be, what does it be, you know, um, that emotion forms, 
That generates curiosity, and the curiosity is what drives questions. And those processes all happen in a very short space of time. So that can be just over seconds. Suddenly we've gone from the prompt to the emotion to the curiosity to asking questions. So you know, what is that? Why is that? How does that happen? So we're often trying to ask those questions. Uh, and the better the questions we can ask them, the better the result we're going to get. So if we looked at, say, for example, if I came to you and said, look, we're going to, um, I'm going to run a course on asteroids hitting the atmosphere, and I'm going to explain to you why that happens uh, and what happens when that happens. I don't think I get a lot of uptake uh, from a lot of people, largely because uh, it's out of context. They don't understand why anybody would want to know why asteroids hitting the atmosphere and, and what that would do. So in 2012, an asteroid did hit the atmosphere in Russia and exploded in front of thousands of people. That prompt meant that everybody, everybody, suddenly in that space, wanted to know all about asteroids. And they wanted to know how that happened and what happened and will it happen again? And, you know, are we safe? Lots and lots of questions. They wanted to learn. And the Russian newspapers in the area ran double-page spreads all about asteroids, what they're made of, where they come from, what they do when they hit the atmosphere, why they blow up, where the bits were, what they were made of, etc. So the whole idea here is to leverage these prompts. And so if we look at that process, if we go down a couple of slides here, not too many. Uh, I got them here. No, it's not here. So different prompts we can use. For example, we can use newspaper clippings, quotes, YouTube clips, objects, art, pictures, prompts stimulate us to go, that's amazing. Uh, how does that happen? How does that work? Why does that happen? And the dramatic uptake now with YouTube is such that YouTube is fantastic and that people are constantly going, that is amazing. If you go and have a look at cello playing, you know, playing the cello can be considered to be quite a sedate activity. But if you go onto YouTube and look at the clip, two cellos, to the number, cellos, there are two guys there who have completely reinvented cello playing. And they're just superb. They've done a fantastic job of just rethinking the whole process. And it's so dynamic and so entertaining. Okay, So uh, prompts stimulate us to become engaged. They stimulate us to feel emotions, and those emotions uh, are, end up forming a curiosity, and the curiosity then ends up generating questions. And that's the start of the learning process. And if we go down and have a look at this learning process, uh, and slide nine here, what we see are two things. First of all, you'll see the prompt there, forming emotion, forming mixture. And that allows us to get to stage one of the learning process. And that allows us to build knowledge from our questions. Now, what we've done with the learning process is we've introduced three levels. So this is the foundation level where we might start out at this point. And from building knowledge, we can then start to make meaning. So for example, if I look out the window as a child and I see leaves falling off the tree, I look and think, my goodness, look, that tree is losing its leaves. An idea is a relationship between variables. One of the variables, or the things that are changing, or the processes that are taking place, one of the variables is the leaves are falling off the tree. And the other variable is the time of year. So there's a relationship between trees losing their limb this time of year. But that only applies to that one tree I'm watching. So I've got an idea for that tree out there, but next year it'll probably do the same thing at the same time. If I then go on and start looking at other contexts, other trees, 
I'll start to realise that some trees lose their leaves and some don't. But we have evergreen and deciduous trees. And gradually if I then start working around that and looking at what makes trees lose their leaves in terms of conserving energy and water and a whole range of different things and stopping them freezing and falling off, what I can start to do is I'm starting to build a concept of trees losing their leaves. And I can recognise which trees by their characteristics will lose their leaves and which trees won't lose their leaves. So I'm now building, I've moved away from building knowledge and now making meaning. First of all by building an understanding of ideas and then starting to look at the concepts. So in our stage one process here, building knowledge, making meaning. The third stage then is applying that understanding. And what I've got to do then is saying, well, what can I apply that to? What can I actually use that for? And so they might decide that, well, you know, for a homeowner, for example, we might decide that I want some deciduous trees that will shade me in the summer, but will lose their leaves and let the sun in during the winter. And so I can apply that understanding. So our first learning cycle here is starting with the prompt, emotion driving our curiosity, curiosity having us ask questions, that builds our knowledge, we're making some meaning, and then we have to go back and build more knowledge and backwards and forwards between knowledge building and making meaning several times, three, four, five, six, seven, ten times maybe. And then we can then move to, once we've got the concept, then we can start applying the concept. So if you have knowledge about one tree, that doesn't actually help you predict other trees. You've got to make meaning out of that. You've got to have good ideas and concepts before you can make predictions. So you see that the prediction zone opens up and becomes more powerful the more deeply we understand the application of that knowledge to the context that we're looking at and then applying that understanding. In the middle there you'll see the competencies. Now the competencies here are critical because if we're going to start looking at learning from this perspective, we have to start giving students that agency over their learning. So the students themselves can become learners and we're starting to transfer a concept here of teachers and students into educators and learners. And the learners then are actually motivated by their curiosity to learn. Student teachers, educators now, use prompts to make sure that the learner is able to work with the context they need to understand according to curricula, etc. and but want to do that because they're engaged and they're prompted to do that. The prompt has stirred their curiosity by those emotions, ask questions and build knowledge and make meaning and then apply that understanding. The competencies allow the learner to have agency over their learning. So it, we've done inquiry learning, and I'm not sure people are familiar with the word inquiry, but inquiry learning uh, is a process whereby students have greater agency or responsibility for their learning. That only works if the students are competent, if they can think and question, if they have a language around learning, if they can actually manage themselves, if they can collaborate, if they can connect and reflect. So these six competencies are absolutely critical and one of the reasons why inquiry learning wasn't very successful in the 80s and 90s was because we never actually gave the students the capacity to become learners. We never taught them explicitly the competencies. And what we've seen in the schools we've been trialling this in, here in New Zealand and in Australia, and I've got two groups of schools in Norway and China uh, coming on board now as well, and Dubai. Uh, what we're seeing in these schools is as we teach kids the capacity to become learners by giving them the competency, they can take increasing agency over their learning. So. That is at level one. We can then see what that looks like at level two, stage two of learning. 
Uh, and what we've differentiated here is we're saying making meaning, we're now splitting that between ideas and concepts. Okay? And we're talking about innovation and ingenuity here. So innovation is coming up with the jolly clever idea, and ingenuity is actually then creating the product, the system, or the environment that actually is the product that we want to actually see at the end of the time. So we're turning that into a reality from an idea and a concept in our head to actually seeing the product, system, or the environment. So this is stage two. The competencies are still the same. Ideas, in order to become concepts, need to apply to more context, additional context. So the more context we apply it to, the better developed our concept is, and the greater our ability is to predict accurately for other contexts. Then we can go to level three. And at level three here, once again, we've then divided IT meaning into ideas, concepts, and concept frameworks. So concept frameworks, when applied to a need and opportunity, that's when we actually start to uh, see innovation ingenuity happening. So the learning process starts with a prompt that stimulates an emotion in the mind of the learner. They're curious and they want answers. But to do that, they first of all have got to actually gain some knowledge. That knowledge, when they apply it to a particular context they're experiencing, will generate an idea. Ideas then apply to numerous contexts, and you can see all the, the arrows going backwards and forwards, all the feedback loops. They're often going back from ideas, back up to knowledge, from concepts, back up to ideas again, from concept frameworks, back to concepts, back to ideas, back to more knowledge. It's an iterative process and a very, very dynamic process. So in the case of uh, learning in this context, the learning process allows us then to actually pass over the responsibility for the learning to the learner and the learner takes on greater agency over their learning. Why do we need to do this? We need to do this primarily because in the past, if we go back 20 to 40 years ago, generally speaking, 80% of people got told what to do with their world, their lives, especially their work world, but also their social world. We had to behave in certain ways. Increasingly now, 80% of people are having to actually work with this on a day-to-day -day basis. In other words, we are being expected to learn on the fly. We're expected to be lifelong learners. We're not expected to be told exactly what to do. Even in education now, educators in some countries, not all countries sadly, uh, have more and more options as to how they meet the needs of their local community in terms of providing an education service. And in New Zealand, uh, we have autonomy. Every school is autonomous. And they actually, we've got a general curriculum, which is uh, 30 pages long. Uh, and 30 pages, mostly pictures, by the way. Um, it's a general framework for what needs to be learnt in schools. But in fact, every school has autonomy over what is taught and how that is taught. And so schools globally now are shifting away from thematic teaching Okay, so thematic teaching is really with the concept of we do plants and space and dinosaurs and heroes and Aztecs, uh, moving away from those, that approach because in thematic teaching what happens there is there's large bodies of knowledge, large bodies of knowledge which are actually pushed out the front and you can't actually progress until you've learnt and remembered those. Okay, so we're going away from that and we're now looking at conceptual learning where people, young students, are being told what the concept is uh, but they're being, that's happening through the use of prompts to stimulate that process. In other words, prompts are replacing thematic approaches to, to teaching and learning. And so students are taking greater agency over their learning and then that means that we can actually 
by giving them greater agency, they can develop their capacity to become a lifelong learner. And if we can allow the young people to have that agency over their learning, and then what happens when they leave school is they have the capacity, because they have those competencies, and they've been taught explicitly, and they've experienced the learning process, and it's been articulated what learning looks like. And that's what these learning process stages are all about. We've got diagrams also um, uh, that uh, in student speak as well. So what we're starting to view now is we're gradually shifting our thinking. Now, my other slides are not here either, but it looks like. No, okay, not here. We'll go back to this one up here. Uh, the, what we're trying to do now is actually realign what we're doing in our classrooms with the neuroscience. And this is telling us that rather than actually front load lots of knowledge that needs to be learned by rote, rather we need to add knowledge just in time. So we're replacing a just in case thematic approach to education to a just in time conceptual approach to education. And the schools that have done this are reporting stunning uh, achievements here and huge amounts of engagement. And uh, my daughter, who's trained to be a teacher at the moment, she came up with me to one of the schools recently and she was there for the whole day. And at the end of the day, she said to me, Dad, that was amazing. Like, there wasn't a single child who got told off in the course of the day. I didn't see one child, and this is a room of 100 students, 100 uh, uh, learners, uh, with three teachers who are roaming. So the kids are managing their learning. And so, really what we're looking at here is we're looking at students having agency over their learning, but we're giving them the competencies to manage that. And we're formalising the process. We're talking to kids to differentiate between knowledge and ideas, between ideas and concepts, between concepts and concept frameworks. So this is quite different from inquiry in many respects. Inquiry was a great idea but it required more structure and it required the competencies at the centre in order to have the learners actually have the capacity to manage their own learning. And that's what we haven't really focused on. So the learning process is inquiry with some steroids added, if you, if you like. It's not radically new, but what we've done is looked at why inquiry didn't learn, work well and then we've married that in with our understanding of neuroscience. And now we've shifted to a just-in-time learning knowledge. In other words, I get the knowledge when I need it. Because all of us now have a device of some form that we can pick out of our pocket if we need to know something. But going from knowing something to understanding something is not something we can do just by choosing something out of our pocket. The last thought I'll leave you with is the dilemma. And the dilemma here really is that uh, reading and writing is still dependent on how well we choose our parents. To make schooling more equitable for more people, what we have to now do is ask ourselves a clinical question, and that is at what point do we say to the child, you know what, you're always probably going to struggle with reading and writing, but have a look at this video, watch the video and see if you can make sense of the idea or the concept they're trying to get across. And you'll find that with the video, they're absolutely fine. Adults and teachers tend to go to Google to get information, text-based learning, because they're good at that. Okay? Learners who struggle with reading and writing, and in fact, most people under 25, so why would I go to Google when I can go to YouTube? And in YouTube, I can stop the video and replay it and replay it and replay it when I need to. And if I want to present my understanding, the best way to present our understanding is to actually teach someone else. So what we're seeing now is what we talked about earlier was teachers becoming educators, students becoming learners. But what we're actually seeing now is that the students are becoming learner educators. 
and educators are becoming, or teachers are becoming, educator learners. In other words, as educators, we're now having to actually learn a lot more about the science of teaching and learning. What is the science that underpins this? What's the optimum way of learning here? Now, just I've got to finish there because I want to give time for questions and there's lots of questions been scrolling down. It's quite distracting actually watching the questions scrolling down. Um, questions, but also if you go to MarkTreadwell, you'll be able to download uh, the book. And so there's a 200 page book there which you can download. Uh, the videos, which I was supposed to finish today, uh, but actually got caught up with one of my daughters the last couple of days, uh, causing me a bit of grief. So um, uh, I'm, I'm been, I haven't got behind with that. So the videos will be up online also in the next couple of days. But if you want to download the book, it's free of charge. You can just download it and use it. And the videos will be available probably in the next three or four days possibly. So beginning of next week, I'll have those ready. And in there are all these diagrams with lots of others. And uh, what we're looking at trying to do is promote this across the world. And if you want to pass that book on to other people, you're more than welcome. Uh, it's an open uh, resource uh, in, the, in sort of the Creative Commons notion. And what we would like to do is to sort of encourage that process of building capacity for all learners by actually keeping the worst learning system we have, learning by rote, to a minimum. Right, now, some questions. So I run the risk by speaking that I'm going to talk over Mark because his audio is still a little bit delayed. But here's how I think we should handle the Q&A. I think it would be too difficult with the audio lag to do questions by microphone. So let's do them by chat, and Mark can respond by reading in the chat. So if you have question that hasn't been answered yet and you'd like to post it, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll let Mark respond. And while we're waiting here, Mark, I was a little distracted by some of the technical issues, but I, you may have addressed this, but um, and if so, please tell me that you did already. But how do you help develop those competencies? The competencies are our greatest challenge, um, largely because educators have little experience in actually teaching uh, the competencies. And uh, this has been the most difficult part of the process uh, in the schools that we have now trialled this in. Uh, a lot of teachers uh, assume that the students, or the, the learners, already have these competencies. In other words, they have a sense of identity, but this is not often the case. Uh, and so in the book, we've actually uh, put a separate chapter for each of the competencies to outline what the key concepts are that go to building identity, what the key concepts are underpinning collaboration, what the key concepts are around the literacy of learning. Uh, and those are in the book, and people can unpack them uh, from there. Uh, but it is the largest difficulty we have. To give you a guideline, uh, we're suggesting is that about 40% of their teaching time needs to be allocated to the competencies. And, and most teachers that respond to that are sort of jaw-dropping, sort of, seriously? You know, where are we going to get that 40% of time from? Because I'm just absolutely busy at the moment. And the response to that is quite simple, really. Uh, if we teach from a conceptual framework, kids often will learn a concept in an hour or two, not three to four weeks. Teaching a topic of Romans might take three to four weeks, but in fact a lot of that time is busy, pretty work, if I was to be really blunt. Most of that time is busy, pretty work, drawing Romans, you know, drawing nice pictures, drawing diagrams of how the army is structured, the Colosseum, etc. It's busy, pretty work. What we would really like the learners to understand is the concepts that underpin the growth of civilization. 
we want to focus on those concepts. And actually, they can start with the context that they're familiar with. Okay? So they, they start with familiar context, just like when you're driving. The first place you take your student to learn to drive is not the motorway. You take them to a, you know, a car park that's vacant, a uh, supermarket car park somewhere, or a subdivision uh, that has new houses being built but they're not there yet. You put, give them a safe context that they're familiar with. The same is true for learners. The initial context we give them are ones where they have a good literacy around that context, and also they have some experiences around that context. And so with a conceptual curriculum, we don't specify the context because the context will depend on the experiences, the literacy of the actual learner. And so schools will individually choose which context they will choose in a given point in time. So, yes, so if you have a question for Mark, please uh, feel free to put it in the chat. I think this is, yes, we're, we're doing fine, although we, if you want to talk at the same time, we'll look at the conflict. Um, it is interesting. I am teaching this 16-year-old to drive, or what I'm doing is facilitating her learning by increasingly allowing challenging circumstances to take place and being supportive and not um, over-coaching. But um, it feels to me like the competencies have to both be understood, sort of lived and modeled by the person who's yeah. hoping to impart them to the learner. Yeah, modeling is important, Steve, but I would also uh, like to say that, in fact, it's not the answer. Uh, learners who are quick to recognize those competencies in the activities of their parents and others will recognize them as competencies, but other learners won't. And so the very people who we need to sort of impart those competencies to probably more than others are the ones that don't pick that up on the fly by watching us. They don't spot that nuance. It's quite difficult. So those competencies we've learnt have actually got to be taught quite explicitly so that actually uh, the learner has actually prompted quite strongly to look at their own world to see whether they have that competency or not. And if they don't, how they can actually manage and improve that competency. So the interesting thing with the, the students in the schools that we have running this process is that they have symbols. So, for example, the managing self, they've got they point at their chest when they see others in the group not managing self. They don't say anything. They just catch the eye of the person who's not managing themselves very well, point to their chest, and then look away again. So there's no social nuance, there's no embarrassment, there's no telling off as such. It's just a reminder you need to be managing yourself better, or thinking better, or connecting better or collaborating better. So the students have developed symbols their own. In each school, they've got different symbols. Uh, and uh, those symbols are very, very powerful. The teacher often uses them as an educator. And also, the learner uses them as well. So it's, it's a very, very strong process, and one that actually the kids pick up really, really quickly. Once people sort of pointing to them, they don't have to say anything. It's just they keep walking, they point to themselves and keep walking, and the, the child that's not managing the Mark, I'm making a promise in the chat that if you send me your slide deck, uh, I'll post it next content. to the description of your keynote on the conference site, um, because people are interested in the slides that they didn't see. And Yella Nam is asking if you would talk a bit. Go ahead. OK, I'll do that. Yeah. Yellen wants to know if you that. can talk a bit about learners with sensory difficulties and also rote well, memory you, difficulties. Okay. I'll, I'll start with the rote learning because that underpins sensory as well. Um, the two processes, sensory learning, the sensory learning system and the rote learning system, are 
both uh, genetically orientated, the um, rote learning process more so. Uh, there are some sensory differences uh, between learners. Uh, and the way in which we get around this is once again uh, not requiring kids to actually love rote learned content. Kids will learn stuff if it's relevant to them in the context that they have in front of them. So a student who, if I go back to the small boy with a little bee in the car park the other day, you know, he wanted to know everything about a bee at that point. And he will remember a lot of it because he's excited. And that excitation is, is the release of hormones in the brain. And this tells the astrocyte to map these patterns, remember these things. Okay. So the more we can do uh, in terms of using prompts, then the better the, remem the memories will be around that, the stronger the memories will be around that. Now, uh, the book talks at some length uh, are around that whole process. And so that might be of some use to uh, whoever wanted to sort of know more about that. Mark, we're pretty much at the book getting close to the top of the hour. Um, I don't see any other immediate questions. Is there anything else that you would like to communicate before we close, especially with thanks for your coming in on such a slow connection? Look, thank you very much for putting up with my slow connection at this end of the world. Um, but please feel free to download the resource uh, from marktreadwell.com and uh, that's free of charge and uh, you can then share that with as many people as you like. Uh, you can just point people back to the website and other people can download it. It's about a 60 meg download unfortunately, uh, but uh, most people can sort of manage that over time if they're given the opportunity. Um, but what we want to do is for people to try and experiment with these ideas. Uh, and once again, uh, we're very, very keen on people carrying out the action research process uh, because there's been lots of fads and fashions who have come, that have come through education. And I'm very keen for this not to be one of those. What I'd like people to do is to test, does it make a difference? So when you're introducing the competencies, you know, do they make a difference? So we need to carry out an action learning process around that as well, to do some research around our own teaching and learning processes. And there's a little device called a Swivel, S-W-I-V-L dot com. They're about $150, I think, US. And these are fantastic. They, you can take a cell phone or a tablet, slip it inside the Swivel, attach a microphone to yourself, and the Swivel will actually then track you around the classroom, recording you on video and also your conversations with students, with learners. And what this allows you then to do is to reflect on your own learning and your own teaching. So as an educator learner, uh, you're looking at both aspects. What am I learning from the learners? And what am I imparting as an educator to them as well? And how effective that actually is. So these swivels have been fantastic. In all our schools, we have them now, in all the schools that use this process. And uh, we encourage people to reflect on their own practice Mark, as much as thank possible you. and carry out the action learning process. That is fine. It's been very enjoyable. I, I hope the audio wasn't too bad. Uh, I hope people were able to thank you, that Mark. Thanks to everybody. Thank you very much. The, the audio audience. actually was quite good, and I think that the recording may get rid of some of the gaps in the the white noise or the lack of uh, audio, and should be a little bit better experience. We will post the full presentation on the keynote page for the Learning Revolution conference. And Mark, I asked the in the chat there, I did a compression program on that PDF and it seems to retain everything okay. Um, if it's okay with you, I'll post both the larger version and the small one in case anybody is bandwidth constrained. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody. What a, what a really fun way to finish this evening. Again, tomorrow right. night, That'd be great. more keynotes, and then Thursday all day keynotes and regular sessions.
Thanks, everybody, for being here. Have a great night or day, depending on where you are. Thanks, Mark. Bye.